Hello and welcome to the Arsenal Bite Size Podcast. I'm FPL Nima, and in Clayton's absence today, we couldn't, you know, resist the big review of the 4-1 victory against Palace. And we have some guests to bring on, so some long-time listeners of the show and good friends, I can call them. Firstly, introducing Bobby Love from Twitter. How, How are you, doing, buddy? Man? I'm not too bad, not too bad. Enjoy the season. It's so, nice to have this two-week break, eight points ahead, isn't it? Yeah, last time we did something like this, we were looking at Arteta being sacked, so it's nice to catch it <laughs> with a positive time. It's a big change, isn't it? And we'll bring in uh, FPL Mike Halpin as well from Twitter, another good friend. How you doing, Mike? Good evening, lads. Okay. It's good to see you. And for anyone um, listening on podcast, not on video, um, I just let you know Mike isn't the only one of us who's on vertical. Um, so he has dialed in through his phone. So this should be good fun. Um, hopefully, we will have no technical errors. This is obviously not a live one. So it's a video on demand and podcast. So thank you if you're listening to the review. And we will be back for the preview live, I think, when we look at the next game against Leeds at home. So before we go into kind of detail about the match report and kind of the four goals we scored, the goal we conceded, I'd just love to get each of you to tell me, I guess, like just a quick one minute or less summary of the match, like how you felt about it. Is there any standout performer you wanted to kind of name drop while you get the chance? Maybe if you want to go first, Bobby, just in terms of the order of the video, and then we'll come to you as well, Mike. I think other than the obvious, it's just really enjoyable watching us put goals past teams again. After that little low we had um, a few weeks back, um, just not being able to put the ball in the net, so just seeing us playing open free football has just been fantastic. Um, for me, I think standout performance has to be Ben White. Just seeing how much he's grown in that right back position is just fantastic, and how much he's just releasing Saka to just find as much space as he wants behind the the two defenders on that uh, on their left side. Just beautiful to watch. I guess just on that note as well, um, before we go to Mike, um, what, what are your thoughts on obviously his omission from the England squad for the uh, qualifiers? Um, from from what I saw, Southgate's kind of quote word on word was along the lines of, you know, it's hard on on him because I already have three right backs who I, at this moment in time, think are playing better football. And Any thoughts on that? Is, that, is there um, more to it than meets the eye? Does that seem insincere? Definitely- Definitely a lot more to it because we never really got a release on why Ben left, whether he was kicked out of the camp or if he just went, no, I'm just going to leave. Um, but I've got no complaints. It's one less player we've got to worry about getting injured over the international break. So, Yeah, I think it's a positive it. for us with so many of our players going away for this international break. Um, and then, Mike, I guess from your perspective, so for Bobby, it's kind of the fact that we're starting to put lots of goals back through teams again after a period where... I think there was a period of about four or five games where we scored like one or two goals and like won one game and drew two and lost two or something. Um, so that was definitely a very troublesome period, especially culminating with that City loss. But since then, six wins in a row. It's the biggest win streak in the Premier League of any team this season so far, surpassing Newcastle's five-game win streak. So, And anything more in terms of from your perspective of what was your main highlight of the game? I think, uh, well, just on that stat there, we have a lot of won six games in a row since 2003-2004. Wow. <laughs> um, so that goes to show how, how much of a record that is. Um, I don't even think the Invincibles done it. I think it was the year before the Invincibles. Um, my performer or moment or highlight of the match, I would say, is Bobby Bobby Holden and his Aleph band. Because I think we was all absolutely shitting ourselves. Uh, not uh, not well. Some of us were at the thought of holding, playing, but I think most of it was the concern of not having Saliba, and that manifested into our concerns over Rob Holding, which was a little bit unfair because we all know Rob Holding as as his limitations, and um, when he put that challenge in on the fifteenth minute that led to that Zaha chance, I had flashbacks of Son last year. Um, so, but after that, he was imperious. He was absolutely magnificent because it was a Bob Holding game. You know, he was the thing with Saliba. You know what you're getting, and I think our our concern was we're not going to get that with Holding. But he had a really good game. So hats off to him, Bob Bob Holding and his fans in the season in the membership pack next year, please. I love that, Mike. Um, I guess just to on kind of his on a perspective from all or nothing we got last year obviously 
he talked about that, you know, he, he'd do whatever the manager wants, whatever is required of him, his role, whether it's to sub on and close out games or use him in whatever way. And I think we underestimate that he is part of that leadership group. People kind of just look at his on the ball quality and compare it to like the Rolls Royce, maybe generational centre back of Saliba. And in these kind of home fixtures, you know, even the Leeds game that's coming up at the Emirates, you got to think that that does not look good if you're one of the leaders of this team and the manager then reshuffles the entire back line to, you know, like put White there and play someone else out of position and experiment with a whole new back four. Well, Thomas because... Partey at, or Thomas Partey at White back. Yeah, that there was, was talk, There was talk of that. And when, and when he when he did go to White back at the end of the game, well, I was like, Thomas, mate, don't don't be spinning up that wing because you're going to do your thighs. You know, we got we got a four week absence with you doing that. So that's a crazy idea of uh, party at the uh, right back. As you say, you got to be able to trust Holden. He's a, he's a good servant to the club. When he comes in, he doesn't let us down. I think we still have scars from Tottenham, don't we? Where to be fair to him, he had Cedric on the right hand side, and as Bobby said there, we got Ben White now. And, and Ben difference. White was absolutely superb. So he's got his mate sitting there going, I look after you, Bob, and, and you can go up, push up a little bit. So it turned into a holding game, didn't it, the way the Palace played? Because I think that Anderson, in injury, they could have caused some trouble with those long balls over his shoulder, um, which didn't materialise because he got injured in the warm-up. Exactly. That that was quite a lucky uh, moment for us. I wasn't sure how Palace would respond to obviously sacking Vieira just days before. Um, I know that Vincent Company's come out and says he doesn't understand it. I think there's more to it than just the league position. I understand that there's a small gap between 12th and 20th, but it sounds like he let go of some of the kind of long-standing coaching staff at Palace, people who were Palace through and through. And I guess those decisions then culminated in Palace not scoring very many goals. And what was a tough run of fixtures to be fair to him but it just seems a bit backward it's like cutting your nose off to spite your face like they go and bring in Roy Hodgson you know 75 years old out of retirement he's now going to take over um it, it just that does not scream ambition to me but that that aside we're here to talk about obviously the Arsenal boys um I, I'm glad you mentioned Rob Holding and Ben White I, I, I do think that that is a very key point. It wasn't even just that it was Cedric to the right of him in that kind of infamous Spurs game. I think Nuno started, Nuno Tavares, you know, we had a, I don't know if it was Lokongro or Neni, like it was a very disrupted squad. Um, and and it's, it's always interesting to see how like when the only player that changes is holding, it didn't look so bad. Like obviously we want Saliba against Liverpool away at Anfield, but to not have to risk him, that was a beautiful moment. And I think every one of these kind of fringe players, I don't know what you think, Bobby, I think they're all going to have their moment in this run if we go on to win the title. Like, we've had the Nelson moments, you know, we've had, um, we've had obviously the holding moment now. I do think there will come a Smith Rowe moment at some point as well in this run. Absolutely. I think everyone throughout the season has stepped up when they've been called up on. Um, the likes of even come the end of January when that window closed and everyone looked at us getting Trossard and Jorginho in and went, that's not going to help you win the title. And then Trossard's got three assists in one half. Uh, Jorginho's helped when Party was out injured. ESR is going to be like a brand new signing as well, just to fill in that left-hand side. So I just think every option we've got there is not even... I wouldn't say it's a drop-off. The, there might not be the quality of a Saliba, but... The, the evolution of the team that Arteta has brought in, just everyone has a role to fill. And we're, we're not seeing any sort of um, downward trajectory when anyone rotates out. I think that's a key point. We're seeing very much a team mechanic at play here compared to maybe just like a single player team. And um, we're not relying on one player to get all the goals. You know, the goals are spread out throughout the entire outfield squad. I think just holding and uh, Tommy Yasu don't have a goal this season out of all the outfield players who've basically scored everyone else has some kind of goal contribution apart from them. Um, and on that note, obviously, best wishes to Tommy Asu. We, we've obviously understood he's had surgery and he will miss the remainder of the season, which is quite gutting when you consider it's a bit of a freak incident, just kind of slipping and then that's it, your knee needs surgery. Um, so we wish him well. Let's uh, go into a bit of a kind of the match summary. So I've got the lineups here for the podcast listeners. Um, you know, obviously, I assume you would know who we started with uh, if you're here for a review of the game. But I will read it out just in case. So we've got Ramsdale, White, Holding, Gabriel Zinchenko. Party with Odegaard and Jacquery the side. 
Trossard through the middle with Saka and Martinelli. Um, I guess the first thought here is, you know, we played on Thursday night a quite physically tiring game. Like, you know, 120 minutes for some of these boys with the likes of Martinelli playing the full 120. You've got um, Zinchenko playing the full 120. People like Saka were only meant to come on briefly, but with the extra time, it became a much longer cameo than we expected. Even Party played longer than we probably would have wanted. Same for Trossard, right? So what are your thoughts in terms of kind of that bounce back from that? What must have been like a really frustrating match, right? Like we got knocked out. We got knocked out in the worst way possible. We picked up injuries. We went to penalties. Um, Martinelli himself missed the penalty. So for him to then go ahead and open the scoring, what do you think that kind of took? Like how, how did he bounce back so quickly? Uh, I just think the, the the empowerment the boys have shown, just um, just being able to just go straight into another match and go, this this isn't going to define us. One one amazing goal from you know, off the halfway line from one mistake that we made in that match isn't going to stop us going into the next game. When we're, we're just going to go back and win this game and power through someone. And Arteta coming out and saying Martinelli came up to him to say, let me play. I want to. I want to prove a point. Just just goes to show, just what the the spirit that goes through the squad at the minute. Sorry, I'm just trying to mute myself because the dog is barking at someone outside. That the people I was talking about earlier. Um... All right. I so think then... you could. I think you could tell in the intensity as well of of Thursday night. You could just see that there wasn't the intensity from us in the tackle. The ferociousness wasn't there. Where we played against a team that had that was their season on the line, so they are putting in everything on the line, which we would have done if we were eighth, and that was our chance at Champions League. You knew that we were keeping something back, but it was absolutely incredible that they managed to have that intensity, um, and you could see it straight off. You know, in the first fifteen, you could just, you, you, as fans, you get that feeling where we're on it. And I got that feeling that we're on it, you know, the Red Sea, the swarming around the players. Look at the way Ben White won the ball off of Zaha for, Sa- for Saka's goal. Um, more, more, they just wanted it more. Now, he showed that, we were showing that on Sunday, but we weren't showing that so much on the Thursday because we were keeping a little bit back. So, I think it was just that, that intensity. Um, and I'd just like to say one more, one mention Jack, Granite Jacker as well, because do you remember when he got injured? And he went down for that and it looked a really, really bad knee injury. It, it and was, I was worrying. I was shitting myself. I was thinking, oh my God, right, ACL, he's done. It looked a bad challenge. It looked like he planted his foot. Then two minutes later, he's steaming into the box, trying to get on the end of a, uh, on a sack of ball. And I'm like, Xhaka, mate, you are just an absolute machine. That guy is a machine. He's got his flaws, but you can't knock his... Uh, his ability to, to play every single game, every minute that you want him to play. So just wanted to mention Jacko as well, because I thought he played superb after not so, you know, a couple of a dip a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, he definitely had a bit of a dip, didn't he? Um, I think maybe teams figured out that he was going to be the late runner into the box, um, you know, with the change in kind of Jesus leaving the team and, and Ketia being in the box, it also probably meant that we had to change our style slightly. So, we weren't seeing as much from him in the goal scoring department, but I think it's underrated his availability. Um, you know, we, we see every manager always picks him. He's got a hundred caps as the captain of his country. Like I think people underestimate the experienced leaders that are needed in a team around this kind of raw talent and youth that we have. Like it's one thing having the youngest team or the second youngest team in the Prem, but if you've got no other experienced winners in there, then what are you going to do? And I think Jacques is definitely one of the experienced guys party is as well. And then Trossard. So to be fair to him, he's come in in January and it looks like he's just always been an Arsenal player. Like, it just, he knows the opposition. He's played all these players and teams before at Brighton. And I don't know if you guys picked up on this fact about Trossard, but he's the first player in, you know, the Premier League since 2012 to get both a hat-trick and a hat-trick of assists in the same Premier League season. And the last player who did that 10 years ago was our very own Santi Cazola. So... That's a nice little fact for anyone who's listening and did not know. But honestly, he's a magician. There was another one that I read during the weekend where Trossard got six assists in his last 30 or 40 appearances for Brighton. And he's got six assists already for ourselves. So just goes to show just how well he's settled into the team as well and helped us push for this title. 
I think the narrative that we lost that January window because we went for like plan B targets and didn't spend on like talent for the future. I think that was overblown because really you want Premier League proven players in this league for a title push, not necessarily someone who will come good eventually, no matter how high their ceiling may be. So I'm delighted by his signing. He's way more versatile than I thought. And he, he just honestly like makes us play closer to how we were playing with Jesus. Um, and, and that's not a knock on Eddie at all. He was one of those, again, that had his time. He came in, he did fantastic against Spurs and against United. And, you know, he, again, had his moment of the season. And hopefully he'll have a few more once he's back from injury. So let's talk about the goals quickly. And then we will look at kind of the data behind the match. But in terms of obviously how the match started, um, we were I, I was very nervous at least after the kind of the fatigue of Thursday. But perhaps as Mike says, the players just want the Prem more. Like, I don't think it was just last Thursday. When you look at all of the Europa games, it feels like we've been trying to win games through jogging. Like, like the passes didn't have the same fears, the, the power on the passes, the deliveries, everything. Just even our defending and pressing, it just feels like when we've been playing in Europa, even though we say we want to win everything, and I know Arteta does, I wonder if the players themselves subconsciously are kind of reserving a bit in the tank when they were playing in Europa because it's not as big a prize as it would have been, right? Like we would have thought it's another route to Champions League and mm -hmm. we're kind of now looking at it like, well, we're kind of in the Champions League. So are we going to keep going further and like exerting in this when there's this huge prize after two decades available? So I can understand that maybe subconsciously they weren't putting it all out there in some of these Europa ties, whereas Sporting, that was their season, as Mike says. And it wasn't just that. I actually, to commend Sporting quickly, I do think they played us at the Emirates probably as one of the best clubs that have come here this season. So it wasn't just a case of us not kind of being fully there, but I think that second half especially, as much as we may have been shocking, like they were our best opponent at home we faced personally, in my opinion. I don't know what you guys think about that. But I think as soon as it went for extra time and Odegaard came on, there was only one team that was going to win that in the end, in, in, in normal time, in open play before penalties, you know, because I think we then realised, because as much as the players sub, you know, consciously and don't want to go for it, they also don't want to lose a football match. Um, and when they're half hour, half hour of going out of a competition that they could could win, I think they kind of woke up. But they were sloppy before that, as you say. The, the, just the intensity wasn't there. The pass was just slightly off. But as soon as it went to uh, extra time, I think we were we were we, we were in, you know up for it. But uh, it's good to see that that the hangover from I remember last year or a couple of years ago, you'd always get the Sunday hangover from the Europa game. You'd, how crap the Europa game was, and no one remembers Europa games. Name me one Europa game that you guys remember in five years. One. I only Apart, remember it because I was... No, I only remember it because I was there, but um, I remember the one... I think it was Europa where Pepe scored the two free kicks. That's like... And, and I don't remember that for the match itself. I just remember it because I thought for the 20th time of his career with us... I thought, this is it, this is it. He's finally going to make it here at Arsenal. Uh, the amount of times I had those moments, Mike, my God. Uh, and the other one is obviously the game where fucking Oba put us ahead, I think, and then he missed the sitter right at the end and we got knocked so, out. Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. only one I remember. That's the pain. I remember pain and suffering. I don't remember any of the good times of the Europa, sadly. Um, but we won't need to worry about that, um, hopefully, next year, right? Like We'll it's... have to compete in the Champions League and fingers crossed um, we'll do great. I never want to hear that music again. <laughs> is it just me that's not felt any sort of disappointment when we have been knocked out of a cup because of what has been going on in the league? Um, I, I, I've not. I think I'm more akin to you. I know that Clayton, he was one of the few that was like, really disappointed when we got knocked out. Like I saw him after the match um, at the Tony Adams statue just to say goodbye, and he just looked like depressed at the time if I'm honest with you like I can tell that he really wanted to win like he mm. wants to win both he wanted the double I think for me I was just looking at it with the draw the way it's gone with Juventus being the next opponent if we'd gone through and after that it would have potentially been Man United I look at all those extra fixtures in between those important ties against Newcastle away Liverpool away City away Chelsea home and I'm kind of like relieved so personally I don't ever want us to lose a game of football especially while I'm there and I think it's similar to what Mike was saying. Like, they didn't want to lose. 
And eventually, once the full 11 made it onto the pitch towards the extra time, we did look by far the best team eventually, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it was almost too little too late. And we didn't really want it enough in normal time, right? That's what I'm thinking. But uh, so in terms of this, then, let's just talk about the first goal. So that kind of delivery from Saka to Martinelli on Martinelli's weak foot. I don't know if you've seen the bench cam of Aaron Ramsdale from our side of the goal, right? And as soon as Martinelli gets the ball, he also kind of kicks it with his left leg. It's like it's like he's kind of thinking, I see this guy do it in training every day. Like, I know what he's going to do. But I, I just thought it was an incredible finish, the way he hit that with his laces and strike the ball on his weak foot. I do think he's been improving. And I, I, I don't know if you guys agree, but I still think that he is our best finisher at the club today. I don't know what your guys' thoughts are on that. I still think it's Eddie, but I think mm -hmm. the progress he's shown this season's fantastic. From being on the sidelines for so much of last season to coming into the team near enough from the start of the season and then just getting 10 goals, 10 assists, just th throughout everything. And he's still just 21. It's just... Um, ridiculous growth in one season i would say we're the only team right i think with three players in double digit goals in the prem this season so that's also a nice thing to i think the only other team in europe who have that scenario are probably psg where they have three attackers on over 10 goals but obviously we don't speak about these oil clubs so they can get out of here and get in the bin and hopefully we'll face them in the champions league and teach them a lesson but um so that, that first goal what, what about you mike and any thoughts on kind of the way Martinelli took that, considering like, you know, he was the one who missed the penalty as well on Thursday. And we saw the players kind of go around him. Martin Odegaard said, you know, we win and lose together. I just thought it was crazy for a 21-year-old to come back from that. I think it's what you guys said last week, you and Clayton in the preview, because you were talking about who we were going to have for the front, front three. And um, I actually said in the chat, I think I put Saka, Nelson and... Uh, Jesus, I think, is what I put. Because uh, I was worried about the minutes, but you made the point that it doesn't look great if you're going to bench Martinelli. And I wasn't, be I wasn't thinking of benching him because he missed the penalty. It was just because he played 120 minutes. Um, but you guys made the point, well, what better way to get out there? And he's got that mentality, hasn't he? That, and you could see in his interview after where he said, no, it's football. Some days you're going to miss. I spent all night thinking about it, but it's over. It's done. And what better way to put that to bed than score a goal like that? Because that was um, on his left foot as well. That was a uh, that was a that was a really nice goal. And and you can see he has been improving on that because he, you know in the past he, he and it's the decision making as well. I think has improved. But he is one hell of a player, and he's only going to get better. So we've got, you know, we're, he's got levels to go. So I, I got kind of laughed at and I, I got told I was exaggerating. Maybe I was in terms of what they've achieved so far. But even earlier this season, my, my kind of thoughts were that when I look at this team, a lot of people compare us to City. They say, you know, if we were wearing sky blue, you'd think it was City. And I kind of tend to disagree because I think we also have like some elements of Liverpool with that pressing. And I think although we play out from the back like City, the work rate and pressing is almost like a prime Liverpool with the Ekin press. And someone like Martinelli, I always talked about how just what he does off the ball, even like his work rate, his defensive work, the way he helps his fullback and will go back to defend. And then he'll be back up the pitch trying to score. I just thought that was an underrated uh, part of his uh, attributes. And at the time, I remember saying that I felt that Saka and Martinelli were like our version of prime Salah and Mane. And obviously maybe... It's a bit of a stretch in terms of how long those guys did it for and how they did it. But, you know, they were competing against each other in a golden boot. And right now, Saka and Martinelli are competing against each other to be top scorer at Arsenal, right? But also, so they, weren't, they weren't doing it when they were 21 years old. That, that's the in, thing. So in, I in thought, the, imagine in, in, what the, they in the premiership, In the premiership, they weren't <laughs> doing it at 21 years old. So I totally agree with you on your point. I, I, thought, I thought similar that it's almost as though you've taken the positional play from from the city of the last five years with the pressing and the the absolute power that uh, Liverpool have had and you've combined them into a team a hybrid team that's taken those and, and is now going to go again with the like we say with a team full of 21 year olds so I love the comparison between Salah and, and Mane obviously it's we're not saying they're as good now 
but on the trajectory, they're 21 years old. And they, what, what, where was uh, Saad Salah at 21? I think he was playing for Basel, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, no, so that's the thing, right, Bobby? So from my perspective, it was never about saying, like, they're equally skilled or they've achieved what those guys have winning the Champions League and the Premier League. I understand that. But it was just the thought that these kids, like, literal kids, are already showing that give it a few more years. Because, you know, look how much better they look now than a year ago. And they said it again in the recent interview. They're like, you know, we've improved. We improve every day. Like, they're only going to keep getting better. Like, I just, for someone like Saka, him especially... I don't even think he's part of like the young player comparisons anymore because he's just simply at the level where he should be compared with the elite wingers of the world. And I think most people, if you look around Europe, like the actual footballers, they know about Sacra Martinelli. Like everyone knows what these guys are doing. Like only the Napoli players are kind of competing on that kind of level like them with that Kovrat. I don't know how you pronounce the full name, but he's another young prodigy, I would say. So there's very few wingers I, I would say you can find that are 21 years old doing what either of these guys are doing. And to have them both at the same time playing and terrorizing, like if you were an opposition defender right now, you do not want to see them in the lineup. Like, seeing that you've got to defend Martinelli or Saka all game, and then they switch wings, which I think they did. I saw in this game like, a few times, I randomly saw Saka playing on the left, Martinelli on the right. I think that was maybe the sporting game, actually. But just that kind of zonal freedom the front three have with Trossard playing or when it's Jesus. And there isn't really a position, right? It's just a zone of a pitch. Like, And Jesus, I think it was incredible when he came on because you could kind of see the way that he would just look up and scan and next thing you know, he'll like be on the left and Martin is in the middle or he'll be on the right. And I, I forgot some of the deliveries Jesus has in his locker because I know they didn't quite convert into assists, but some of those passes he was making into the box and whipping them in from outside the box. I was like, okay, like there's a reason this guy has a lot of assists for us. Um, you know, Jesus today, I think he's still like fourth for like assists in the Premier League table after missing three months of football. So Did you see that? There, did you see that one that Granit Xhaka has got more assists than Foden, Son, Marvez? Um, that's wild. <laughs> yeah, and he's also that's more assists, and he's also got more goals than Anthony, but obviously Richarlison. There's a mad like thing that he's got. There's absolutely no way you put Xhaka ahead of goals scored or assists by the likes of uh, Foden, Marvez and Son. It, it's, it's a crazy, crazy stat. It just shows what a crazy season we're having, right? So then in terms of, I guess, the second goal, so I felt like in the first half, generally, I don't know if you guys would agree, but I felt like we were kind of dominating the possession and territory. So like we did look like the, the fatigue hadn't quite got to us. Um, but it was actually Palace, right, who had the first chance. So I almost felt like this inevitability and worry that if we go a goal down, we're not going to be able to play this game our way. Like, we need to get a few goals. We need to get ahead and dominate. Um, and it was obviously Zaha was always going to be a threat. And I think beyond that moment where he kind of ran through from the halfway line, um, White did very well to nullify him beyond that. But, um, you know, Ramsdale somehow, I don't know how he didn't get an own goal from it. Like, I, I watched back that replay like five times. Um, obviously, it bounced off the back of him and somehow went out rather than into the net. So, I feel we got a bit fortunate there, I must Definitely. admit. It's like... Yeah. It was almost like watching our goal against Villa when he hit off the bat of Martin. As I said, I thought that's going to happen to us, but no, we, we rode the luck and then we just didn't see them after that. Really, exactly. So, I feel like that was kind of their big moment, and I'm sure the cumulative XG we look at will show that. Um, in terms of um, obviously Saka, then he goes in. Um, so White and Saka, I think their play together and their understanding, and even with Odegaard in that triangle now, it's just automatic. Like, I, I noticed, like, White will receive the ball and he'll just suddenly stay still and then he'll release it because he, like, knows where or when Saka will arrive into different positions. And they just have this telepathic chemistry, which what, that's why I asked about the England thing earlier because I find that crazy that a nation would not take two-thirds of a working right-hand side for the league leaders and want to use that in their nation national setup right like I, I just find that a bit crazy like spain at their best were basically like the barca team plus a few madrid guys so you know if you've got players who play together at club level at this level and have this understanding it just seems mental to not utilize that in your national team but what, what are your thoughts on that kind of uh, link up between white and saka mike for the second goal um i think 
they were um it, it, it was just they're just unplayable that right hand pod uh, at times you know when when and they're now becoming a, a to a point where they just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and relentless you know um the stats for ben white for progressive passes uh key passes into the final third uh, are really really impressive so um that is such a good uh, partnership and and it's getting better and better the way the more that they're working together with the underlapping the overlapping from why as you say that the, the ball that they're, that they're playing to each other um it's just superb it's just so just so 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 nice to watch considering that you know i think i feel a bit sorry for tommy asu because he's just not going to get back into that he's never going to play as a right back again for 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 first choice no no chance so i thought he would be like a backup left back if tierney left. yeah so that was kind of my yeah. thinking um but yeah like I, I do tend to agree i think White has been hugely underrated this season. Um, I think he's in for shouts as one of the best right backs in the league this year. And I think people just, um, you know, they laughed at us when we signed him for 50 mil. But what people tend to forget is he was also one of our best centre backs last year. He's then converted to a new position with, diff- you know, new physical demands on his body that he's had to learn. He's done great. And on top of that, he is actually the most expensive signing under Arteta. There is no one over 50 mil. So I think just the way like the way this squad has been assembled. So on transfer market, they recently did this update. This is Saka's the fourth most valuable player in world football. Obviously, some of these numbers are made by a guy behind a laptop at home. Like, you know, it's just a nice kind of, I guess, it's just a way to look at it and have some kind of uh, balance. But it's not exactly right. But these kind of um, transfer market squad values, they currently have Arsenal as like, I think it's the fourth most valuable or third most valuable squad in world football. So when you think it's been assembled with youngsters and no one over 50 more has been purchased for it, the Manchester United squad is valued at less in this same table. And this is after spending 230 mil this summer, having a £1 billion squad already that was a title-challenging team that added Ronaldo, buying world-class players in every position, you know, having the best right-back, centre-back, goalkeeper, defensive mid and striker in the league, best manager in the league. And we'll go back to those guys on, in a few slides time. But I just want to put that out there. It's wild how you could spend all this money and then your team actually ends up being worth less than a team that did not spend the same amount of money as you. So I think we've seen the new um, updates to our structure. Obviously, like we've seen Edu, we, we know he became technical director from sporting director earlier on the year. Now other people in his management setup have become like assistant sporting directors and there's head of recruitment now. So it feels like we're really putting some stuff in place to cook this summer is what I'm sensing. Yeah, so I'm excited. Now in terms of, I guess, just quickly on Rob Holding before we talk about the third goal, I did just want to mention that, you know, he actually completed more passes than any other player on the pitch in that first half. And he also won the most duels. So he won eight duels uh, in that half. So that, that was just an incredible first game back from him. And he's not played for us since, like, I don't think he started since the last day of last season. He didn't look out of place at all once he came in. So it's great to just see him step up once he came into the team. And he's going from the 5-3-2 defender to starting in a back four, I just think if Saliba is out for a little while, I'm not as worried. I'm more worried about not having depth on the right side than Gordon being in the middle. But you don't want him, you don't want him going to Anfield. We yeah, do not want Rob Holding not. at Anfield. No, I, we I, give him. We, we give. We give. Uh, we give. We give Saliba. You know, leads. We can have him off for leads, but we ain't going to Anfield with 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 Holding, mate, because we're in trouble if that happens. Now, yeah, no, I, I do. T- I definitely agree. I think that game's going to be massive for us. And you'd like to think Liverpool will just kind of let us win by as many goals as we can to get revenge for City ruining, you know their best era in football and kind of doing it through 110 plus financial breaches ruining their legacy and reducing them to banter people saying oh they have one title one champions league and one cup and you guys say they're the best team i'm like mate these guys had like 99 98 95 point seasons back to back like it's not as simple as just reducing it to what they won like they literally got cheated out of trophies from what I'm seeing, from my perspective. We'll see how these cases against City go. But if I was Liverpool, I'd be doing Arsenal a favour here. I don't think they will, but 
it would be nice if they did it in a way to get back at City, right? Hopefully they beat them in a couple of weeks. That's the first step. That's them. If they can beat them then and let us win, you know, like let just field some kids, then I'll definitely um, be there making friends with a lot of Liverpool fans. So obviously the halftime break then came. Um, it didn't do anything really to slow down our momentum. You know, this is where Xhaka then came in and got another goal after having scored on Thursday as well. We saw he did the celebration, obviously, again, to you know, for his daughter. And I just thought back for a moment that when you look back, it was the Palace game when he got booed as he was subbed off and threw the captain's armband on the floor all those years ago. And just to see the turnaround where his wife is on Instagram sharing a video of his daughter celebrating the goal with the same celebration of Xhaka scoring against the same team that that incident happened in all those years ago. That kind of remontada of Xhaka, the comeback, Nothing has banged more for me, like in a long time. Like just to see, like he was so he was like on his way out the club. Forget just losing captaincy. Like it looked like that was it. And I'm just so happy to see that turn around. It's just crazy to think Roma didn't want to pay 16 million for Granit Xhaka, and now he has on the way to possibly winning a Premier League and having his best goal scoring season. It's just crazy the turnaround he's had in two three seasons. It's just. You can see how happy he is, is as well on the football pitch. I think he's only been booked three times this season, whereas he was a walking red card most games. It's just fantastic having someone step up that much as well. You could see that he was trying to make up for not getting that goal against Fulham as well. Mm. You know, that one where he would have finished it off, that beautiful move. Would have been and one of the team all, goals of the decade. Uh, like Jackie, like, like the Wiltshire goal. It was like, well, it would have been up there for me. Um, and he just, but on this one, he uses absolute determination and sheer will to put that ball over the line. So, fair play to him. It, but it was a beautiful pass from Zinchenko, the way he opened that up. Um, and then it was a quick interchange. Trossard came across, uh, put the ball in, uh, and it was a lovely pass and, and just a great, great finish for, from Jack. And I'm really so happy for him. I was going to say, just like it's worth mentioning the guys in the build up, which you've done. So, obviously, the way that Zinchenko got the ball in initially and that double up with Trossard to play off each other, like just the way he slipped him in and Xhaka arrived, even just the goal, right? Like, I don't know how he, like, not only did he try to make up for the missed goal, but I don't know how he finished that move. Like, I watched that replay multiple times and people were like, oh, it must be an own goal. And I'm like, no, no, like, it definitely hits his foot. Like, I don't know how he got his foot in there, but he got his foot in there. (laughs) Like he was falling over like he collapsed on the floor while taking the shot and he still got it in the net so I was so delighted for Xhaka um, we will continue Bobby and hopefully um, we will get Mike back shortly um, for anyone who is watching he's just disappeared off the screen briefly just, just as we're talking about Xhaka as well see him and Ben hugging I know it led to their goal but celebrating managing to double up on a player and put the ball out just I was celebrating watching it as well uh, when I was watching the highlights. That's a nice moment to bring up, actually. Yeah, just seeing them together, the camaraderie in the team, the way they celebrate kind of, um, you know, even the defensive actions, not necessarily just the goals. Um, in terms of obviously at this point, then we have uh, Trossard with his sixth Premier League assist that was in this. So, you know, it's what you were saying. Like he had like six assists in like 40 games or something for Brighton before this. He arrives and he's already got his six of assists with Arsenal. So he's just honestly mental. Um, now, Palace obviously hit back. Um, so I think there's a good time to talk about it as you've kind of gone there naturally. Uh, you know, we didn't deal with the corner at the near post. Jeffrey Schluck pounced on it from close range and pulled one back. I do think that gave the visitors some confidence. Um, Zaha then slid a shot just wide after Schluck won the ball in midfield a bit later. But overall, I don't think they kind of came back into the game so much. Um, so w- welcome back, Mike. We're just talking about Palace's goal quickly, um, saying it gave them a bit of momentum. Yeah, you know. it, it pushed life into them. I thought we were we were suffocating them uh, and I thought it was, you know, done. And they were really sucked the soul out of them. And I don't know if you mentioned it, but I think it it, it was funny, the um, the Ben White and the Xhaka. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were just saying, yeah. Uh, they were uh, but, celebrating, obviously, getting the ball yeah. out and double teaming, which is nice to see for defensive course, actions. But if you go, you know, if you, I bet Arteta will be telling them, Ben, just turn round and take the ball up the other way. Because, by, you know, he wanted that habit moment and the, the, the cheer. And I get it because you're in the stadium. It's going to rile the crowd up. It's going to give you that. Absolutely smashes it. And then they score from the corner. 
But I think you know, yeah, we need to we need to be on top of these uh, set piece goals, though, don't we? They've been happening quite a lot recently. I'm sure the set piece coach will also be kind of keeping an eye on it, and they'll be maybe working on it in the training ground over this break uh, for the guys who haven't gone on international duty. But we were so good at defending set pieces earlier this season. You know, we've been scoring from them a lot, but it just suddenly out of nowhere, it feels that we've kind of almost been starting to switch off at some of these set piece corners because. I think we were the lowest goals conceded from set pieces. Like we conceded zero goals from corners for like half of the season. And then suddenly it's just happening every game. So I don't quite know what's changed there or like why that's happening. But um, in terms of obviously from there, we kind of killed any hopes of them coming back, even though there was a bit of momentum once Saka got his second goal. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, obviously, Kieran Tierney has been subject to a lot of media stuff about him potentially leaving in the summer for game time. I thought when he came on, he reminded us that he is just an elite, technically gifted fullback. And just because he doesn't play the inverted role of Tim Zinchenko does not mean that we should want him to go. I, I, I do think if he wants to leave and we can't stop him, fair enough. But when we've got Champions League next season, to have a player of his calibre and to be able to bring him on and that assist he gave to Saka, obviously, for the goal, he cut it back to, um, to Saka to drill home. But I just thought he was being asked to play the Zinchenko role, right? And he kind of... Seems to be getting better at it. I know it's not as convincing, but I just, I would not want to lose a player of that quality, especially if now we're looking at Tommy Asu coming back from surgery. Suddenly this idea of a backup left back in Tommy Asu is, that's not really an option anymore. So I really would hate to see Tierney go to someone like Newcastle, who is strengthening and could become one of the kind of top four contenders going into future years. I would hate to give them an option like that to compete against Dan Byrne at left back. Especially how long it's taken us to really get a full season out of him as well. He's been available for so much of the season. It's just been a shame we've changed our tactics so they don't quite suit his play style. But having someone like TNA to come off the bench in the 75th minute of any game next season will be amazing. Especially if you've got his pace and Martinelli's and Smith Rose all going down that left hand side. You can't imagine any right back's going to want to face that. So I do hope we do hold on to him as well. There will be game states that he'd be perfect for. Definitely. Um, so I think just from there, um, so actually this is the first time since 2004 that we've won four Premier League games in a row by scoring at least three goals in each of them. So so even that, that's another incredible stat. So, um, you know, Arteta was able to bring off quite a few players in the closing minutes, which was good to see as well. Obviously, we saw some early subs for people who'd already had a lot of minutes in their legs. Um, in terms of what it means, I think I think we've talked about most of the players. We shout out, obviously, like the likes of Gabriel and Zinchenko. We're not specifically spoken about party. I think we all know how incredible and vital they, all three of them are to our system. So I think we speak about them most weeks. So I don't think we've missed too much here. We focus mainly on the goals. I did see their manager, um, their interim manager was a bit cheeky in his interview. And he was kind of like, oh, you know, like the fourth goal was offside. And like at 3-1, we were in the game and it could have been 3-2. And I'm like, bro, just take the 3-1 then. I don't really care. Like, just fucking move on with your life, bro. Like, you had no chance. You had no hope. Not the way these guys showed up hungry like that. Like, when I saw them come out and they just completely put Thursday behind them like that instantly, it's like, no, Palace have no hope. We do not need to be worried here. Uh, apart from the Ramsdale kind of potential own goal that almost happened. Um, but yeah, complaining about offside, I just thought this is a bit pointless. Like, um, just wait for fucking Roy to come and take the job, buddy. Let's um, let's talk about what it means for our season, obviously. I, I don't think I'm going to go through this slide because we're already 43 minutes in. Um, I'll put it up on the screen for anyone who's on pod and wants to come and just look at the data from Mark our stats. But we won't talk about this much. It just kind of shows what we were saying that, you know, for the first few minutes, you can see the cumulative XG was higher for Palace because of that kind of potential goal moment. But it didn't really show anything again until after our third goal. And it was around the kind of 65th minute when they got their goal and then they kind of came to life a bit. So the XG, the kind of cumulative XG looks quite close at 1.5 and 1, respectively, for Arsenal and Crystal Palace. But I don't think in reality that paints the full picture because the game state changed. We didn't really need to keep going once we had so many goals and... I think anyone who wants to see this data visually do come and check it out at this timestamp. But let's um, talk about what it means for our season so far. I think let's spend five minutes just talking about this and then we'll wrap up. So obviously uh, we played 28 games. We have, you know, 69 points. We have 40 goal difference. We have Man City breathing down our neck. They played one game less. We're eight points ahead, but they got 42 goal difference. And Man United... Um, 
I still included them in the screenshot. They, they do have two games in hand, although they are like 16 points behind or something ridiculous. But um, yeah, they have six goal difference. So I just, I just thought I kind of put that out there. I know the seven goals from Liverpool doesn't do them any favours, but um, right now they have zero Premier League goals in March. I know, I know they only played two games, but you know you, you still got to kind of think to yourself, just a few weeks ago, there was a lot of energy being directed at we're five points behind. You know, if you lose to Spurs and then we beat you and we beat Palace, then we'll be level on points and we are title challengers. And there was a lot of this talk I saw on the timeline. And I just think it's a bit mental because, you know, I said to a United friend of mine, like a personal friend of mine, I said to him, you know, there's got to be signs that you got to, like, there's got to be some signs to give you faith. And he goes, there's signs all over. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we're in banging form. You're drying up with goals. And I said, bro, you're just fucking analyzing outcomes, man. Like, you had the second easiest fixture run from the World Cup restart till this day. Yeah, okay, you beat City, sure, with an offside fucking goal that they said would be offside if they looked at it again. So thank you for that, by the way, guys, because that helps us against City. So thank you. I appreciate your offside goal there. That's all good. But after all that talk, you're telling me a team that is... Fucking 34 points behind in goal difference. A team that ended last season with zero goal difference. You genuinely think that that's a title challenging team? I'm sorry. So I just think they got a bit ahead of themselves there. No offense. I've got lots of United friends with fans. But I said to him at the time, I was like, what do you mean there are signs all over, man? Like, we are about to, like, go on to, like, a great run of games. You know, after City, we've won six We've scored fucking 20, 19 goals in these six games, 14 goals in the last four in March. And I'm like, bro, like, this is just mental. Like, how could what you said on March 1st, and we're only on what, March 21st, how can it go so monumentally wrong in such a short period of time? He's like, oh, you know, but my mind changed after the 7 0. Once we got spanked like that, then I kind of thought we're not title challenges. I was like, okay, mate. Like, yeah, I was seeing pictures going up for Manu and for the quadruple to quickly complaining about Manu having a game every three days and Arsenal don't have to do this. It's like, that's fine. Just understand where you're at in your season and where we're at. We're now, there's no doubt. Right. There's no doubt that they are the third best team in the league. I'll give them that. What Ten Hag's done in a short period of time is great. You know, he had to deal with someone who was a superstar who was being toxic in the dressing room. Like we had to deal with Oba. He dealt with that. He's got them a trophy for the first time since Rooney played for the club. You know, he's finally got that duck off their back of you no know, trophy in six years. So, yes, he's doing great stuff. But he started from a better starting point, in my opinion. He inherited a much better squad than what Arteta inherited. And it isn't his first managerial job either. So I just think it's a bit mental when he was coming in and talking about the era of Man City and Liverpool and stuff is over. When I'm pretty sure Ten Hag is older than some of the managers that he's apparently the new era taking over from because it makes it sound like he's very young, but he, he, he's he's been managing for a while. Um, overall, let's talk more about what this means for Arsenal then for these last few minutes. So 10 games to go, some tough away fixtures in there as well, as we mentioned. What, what do you think? What, what are your guys' hopes? Are you If you were told at the start of the year that we would have 10 games to go, we'd be eight points clear, would you have believed it after the way last season ended? I remember saying in my group chats that I thought it would be better and would be within 12 points of the two teams that are fighting for the title, but will it be one season too early? We'll just be fighting for Europe and getting the Champions League position. So it's far beyond what I expected. But from here, it's just all nerves. Every game is nervous. Can we just keep this going? Can we just keep this going? And then it's what the boys keep saying is every game is just that's all the focus on. It's the next game. And that's all I'm trying to worry about at the moment. How about you, Mike? Um, are you looking at five game blocks or are you more uh, of a one game a week man now as well? I've gone for it all. <laughs> every, all, all, all of it. One game, three games, ten games. Uh it's do you know what I think look, I'm I'm slightly older than you guys and um, I've actually forgotten how all consuming a title challenge is and how much it absolutely takes over like I just thinking about it all the time and you just don't want to you know it's just a roller coaster isn't it all season um, 
because whatever happens, it's been an absolutely fantastic season. I just want to say that. And I've seen football and felt, I've felt things that I haven't felt about Arsenal for a long, long time. The connection with the club, the, the fan base, the, they're all aligned, the club. And we haven't had that for 15 years, 10 years, really. Um, but I've forgotten how great or how nerve wracking a title challenge is. Um, but I just want it so bad. And I want it. I, I want it so bad. Obviously, we all do. But I want it for the younger generation because there's a hot, like the Ashburton Army boys that are doing a fantastic job. Clayton, one of them. See him on the telly the other day on the second row. Um, so for those guys, because they, they've not experienced some of the things that we were lucky enough to see. I don't know how if you remember the title challenge of or the, the title winning of 2004. Um, but it, 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 it's their moment, you know, for them to have that moment. Because a lot of generation, you know, you grow up very complacent with Wenger. And I, I go back then, 2004, we were absolute the dons, invincible. We're thinking we're going to rule it for 10 years. Mm. And uh, we have a <laughs> one. You know, yeah. A lot of that was Chelsea coming in and, and absolutely blowing the, everything away. Because there's no coincidence that Chelsea came, Abramovich, 2005... We never won a league since then because a lot of players that they were going for or they ended up buying, we would have naturally have bought. But so, yeah, looking at those 10 games, obviously Leeds is the next one. And then we start getting into the crazy world of, oh, no, I don't, don't want that to think that's an easy game. And I think we were touching on it later or in a bit that if you remember last year with the international break, Odegaard came back injured, Party came back injured. And that was what derailed us last year was that mm -hmm. March international break. We didn't bottle the league. We ran out of players that were of a standard that you could put in your first 11 because you went... We, we played the last, like, I guess... Yeah, with more Holden. Than, I think five games plus. We had Cedric, Rob Holding, Nuno Tavares, El Neni and Eddie. And yeah. that was like Eddie's first ever time getting run of minutes in the team. So, and he did great, don't get me wrong, but it's like, that is massive disruption. I just so we that's need like half of a squad change. So we need this. Uh, we need to have a fit. You know, let's see what comes back from uh, England uh, and uh, and all the others that have come back, um, and get leads. Deal with leads. Don't take them lightly. You know, and I think it's good to see that the players are absolutely laser focused. And I loved what Saka said in the interview on Match of the Day. We don't fear anyone. We don't fear anyone. And now that's easy for the players to say, man, because. I'm shitting it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sitting Absolutely. here at home, like, bricking every match. So I think what you mentioned about the emotion, like, every game is nerve-wracking. Bobby mentioned it as well. Like, I just feel so all-consumed by the Arsenal right now. And I know there's only a couple months to go. It feels like the big prize is there. We have to go to the Etihad. We have to play City again. And hopefully, we'll finally play them with Jesus and Party. Because right now, we've yet to face them with those two players. And... I think that's going to be vital for us. But um, for me, that's like a don't, we can't lose game. I don't think we have to win that at the Etihad. No. I think it's just a case of you don't lose that and you maintain whatever gap we have by that point when we get there, if we have a gap at all. I think if we get 11 points out of our next, is it five games? I think if we get 11, that's included. I think out of that, it's like the Liverpool game is included in that. Um then I, I, I think we're we're on. We're, we got we're going to take some stopping if we get if we get. Don't worry about what they do. Obviously, we hope that Liverpool do us a favour. Uh, they've still got a couple of dodgy games or tricky games. But we think got people fun. talk about that they don't have like tough yeah. away games, but, but they have. That just means they're playing those teams at home. So like, that, you know, it doesn't mean they don't have tough opponents. I think people are underestimating that. You know, City dropped points at home this season to quite a few teams, right? Like team, the teams that have taken points from us this year have also taken points from City. Mm -hmm. It's just funny how every time City bounced back and won one single game, they were suddenly back and would go on a fourteen-game winning run. And yet this season, they've not main, they've not gone over a three-game win streak once. Yeah, so I just find that wild. That, that like I understand they've done it before, but the players who were there for those win streaks at the end of seasons are no longer there. Like Zinchenko has gone. Jesus has gone. Sterling is gone. You know, like a lot of the players who contributed Jane, to that uh, are gone. 
Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And even now, like, I just think that the further they get in the Champions League, the better for us. Their focus should hopefully be on that. With these tough ties against Bayern, two legs, you would hope that, like, if Haaland's kind of niggle is real, that maybe he won't be risked against Liverpool with Bayern in the midweek. So there's also that. And I think that I do want them to get through against Bayern because if they do get through, they're then going to have to play one of Real Madrid or Chelsea over two legs as well. So for me, that's just vital that they we go as far as they can. Get to the final, make them make choices. Let them make choices and then make it make it difficult for them that they, they're going to have to privatise um, between the lineup on the Wednesday and the lineup on the Saturday. And, and that's all we can do. And if we win our games... If we, we just keep winning, we, we keep doing nine, what we're doing, yeah. We win nine games. I'm not saying that we will, but if we win nine games, it's ours. Yes. No matter what they do. And Guardiola so, himself has come out and said his tenure at Man City will be a failure if he doesn't win the Champions League. If he gets to a semi or a final, that's got to be his focus. So not that we need to rely on them. It's, we're five points clear and if they win the game in hand. So it's all in our hands. And that's the, the best part of this. I think my hope is that there's like a psychological element in that if Liverpool can do a massive favour and somehow win that game and we can also make sure we don't take leads lightly and win that, yes, we'll have a game in hand, but we're suddenly going to be 11 points ahead. And I think psychologically, if we're 11 points ahead and then they've got two ties against Bayern to play, what happens to the Premier League fixture in between there? They're thinking, oh, shit, 11 points. Oh, no, we better not get knocked out in the quarterfinals against Bayern. So I just think that there's so much to it, like, that hopefully, if everything falls the right way, that they they, they can't... Like, we're just very fortunate, I would say, in the sense that the draw, because they could have drawn someone like Benefica and they may have rested players in the Champions League and thought they could still get through because of the quality they have. But when you're playing the likes of Bayern and then after that, Real Madrid or Chelsea, they can't be resting no one in those games, I don't think, personally. Same in the semi-final of the FA Cup because they can't, they cannot lose that. Mm. Because how can, what, they got, um, is it Sheff Sheffield United, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. United, right, so they got Sheffield United in the FA Cup. Uh, so how can they possibly afford to lose that? And then Just, let Man United go get the trophy, you know. That's so... It's worked out uh, well in that sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, any any sure. final thoughts, guys? Um, obviously, um, I think just a few parting thoughts would be nice and we'll wrap up at the one hour mark. But um, thank you as well to anyone who's listened so far. If you enjoyed the episode, obviously hit that like button, please, and subscribe if you're new. But I'd love to get just a final takeaway from you guys, not about the game against Palace, but about, I guess, what you hope to see when we come back on April 1st against Leeds. Like, what, what, what are your hopes? What are your dreams for the remainder of the season? Well, the opposite of the performance last time we played Leeds would be a be a start. We got lucky that time, but as long as we can go into it the same way we did Palace and just go right, when, we know it's going to be close. We know goal difference is going to count. Let's just blow these off the park, wrap it up, and then make changes toward the end and just keep ourselves fresh for every game this season. That's all we can ask for. That's all I can ask for as well. Nice. How about you, Mike? I think just just keep doing what we're doing. You know, it sounds it sounds so simple, but you could tell if you go back to the Everton game, um, we weren't as tenacious. You know, we weren't as tenacious in that game. We were just off of it slightly. You know, we still played decent. We didn't play shit in that game. We 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 put some of passage of play together for about twenty five thirty minutes, and then. We know the all the perfect storm with Everton, but I just think if we can keep doing what we're doing, the metrics are there. Mm. We know they are. We see them every week. You show them every week. We we know what we're doing. You know, we're knowing. We we're not panicking. So if the if you just keep doing it, one game it's so boring, but it's so true. And and, and Arteta's not going to let these and it, let these guys get away with it. Uh, run away within their heads. You know, you've got the likes of Xhaka coaching on the pitch. You've got Jorginho coaching on the sidelines. You've got Zinchenko. You've got... And did you hear the quote from Jesus saying, um, this is the best time of the year because this is the exciting bit. This is where it's the business end of the season. And we haven't had someone like that at our club. But like last know. year, it wasn't just the injuries and the young Finn squad. <laughs> there was no one of this experience with previous. I think people have overblown that Arsenal don't have any prior winners. Therefore, it's a disadvantage to them. Because we do have, I think I saw something recently, we have like nine 
league titles in this squad. Not all of them are Premier League, of course, but there's like four each for bloody Sinchenko and Jesus alone. So I do think some of that winning mentality coming in and the experience of the run-in, which Jesus, as he says, is the most exciting time. Also, I just so, can't wait to see Jesus going again. I also want to say for the fans, we've got to, we've got to keep it in check as well because I think in the uh, the first half an hour it was a little sounded a little bit subdued because it's nervous, isn't it, in the stadium where three months ago everyone's just having a party and enjoying themselves and it, the, the atmosphere is absolutely superb and it's changed this season and last season as well, but. I think as fans, we've got to we got to keep it steady as well, you know. The, the, if you and I think we are, but that first half hour in the stadium, it, it can be a little. If we're not on it straight away, there's a little bit of nervousness that's going around. So yeah, it's we, we're all in it for in the ride, aren't we? We just got to buckle up and um, just hope we can keep going. No, definitely. Enjoy the ride. So I think on that thought, that's a great way to leave it is just enjoy the ride because we don't know when this will happen. Obviously, we would like to think for a young squad, it can happen over the next few years again. But the reality is the last thing you want, win or lose the title, is to look back at this year and feel like all you felt was nervousness for the whole year. If you didn't enjoy the moments, to celebrate the victories, enjoy the goals that we're scoring, the free-flowing football we're playing with this squad, and you're not just in love with it and enjoying yourself, it's kind of like, what's the point? Because I, I understand that there's a trophy to win at the end of it. One team wins that trophy, right? And to have had the season we have, whatever happens at the end of it now, I just think it's been one of the best Arsenal have ever played. Like, And that's no joke. Like, People are coming out saying that even like Invincible era and stuff like that, like, this is like some of the best the stadium has been, the fans, the players, the connection, as you mentioned. So I think let's just enjoy it. Let's be the 12th man. Let's not let the nerves override the joy we should be feeling to see our club play like this. Like we've not seen our club at this level, this caliber for such a long time. And I just think that's a really wise way of leaving it, Mike, of just enjoy this journey because there's 10 games to go. Enjoy every week, no matter how hard it might be to kind of sit there from behind the sofa or in the stadium and you're worried and nervous. Just try to get past that and try to enjoy this period because this is what football is all about. And we are right now at the top of it. So just enjoy it while we're here and long may it continue, I think. But yeah, um, anyone who's listening on podcasts as well, do check out um, on Twitter. Look up Bobby Love if you want to stay in touch and FPL Mike Halpin. When I tweet out the show, I will put both their handles as well so it's easier to find the guys. But um, honestly, thank you both for coming on. It's been a pleasure to speak to you guys. Hopefully we can do something at the end of the season with Clayton as well, like an end of season review. Um, hopefully it'll be a celebratory one where I pop champagne on air, but we'll, we'll take it one week at a time as uh, Arteta and the boys said. We're going to have a little, if we do do it, we've got to think up of something that you've got to wear or that we all yeah, wear. Yeah, that's true. We need to have some kind of um, theme. Live part of the trophy parade. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah i want to i want to be there doing a trophy I'm down, parade but it all, i'm down that weekend that's all i'm saying i'm, I'm coming down that weekend 100 <laughs> we need to go around the streets of london all together if there's a bus parade guys we have to do it but um i won't get ahead of myself yet i'll just enjoy the journey for now thank you everyone for tuning in uh thank you to our guests bobby and mike it's been a pleasure everyone enjoy the international break recoup recharge and bring back all your energy for the run-in up the Arsenal. We will see you all next time. Peace. Up the Arsenal.